Welcome to Season 10 of the Art of Teaching Podcast. I'm Matthew Green and I'm so grateful that you've joined me today. Before we get started with our discussion, I would like to acknowledge the Dharawal people, the traditional custodians of this land on which I'm recording, and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the stories, traditions and living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on this land. Today I have the great pleasure of sharing a conversation I had with the brilliant Dr. Bernie Marino, who is a passionate educator and parent who lectures at Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Her work centres around school leadership perceptions and its impact on school effectiveness and improvement. She is passionate about leadership identification, development and retention in schools. We covered a lot of ground in this conversation and honestly I could have chatted to her for hours. We talked about the importance of self-reflection, the power of the words that we use, and why we must take a kaleidoscopic approach to leadership. The links to her work and her professional profile will be in the show notes. I hope that you get as much out of this conversation as I did. Please enjoy. Dr. Bernie Marino, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Where are you phoning in from? Thank you very much for having me. So I'm in Melbourne. I'm in Brunswick. So Lovely. pretty inner north Melbourne. <laughs> Fantastic. And I can see uh, on your screen that you have the University of Melbourne crest. It makes me feel uh, very homesick, even though I'm a, <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm uh, from Sydney. I, I, my experience at the University of Melbourne was just was just wonderful. Is it as fabulous to work there as it is to study there? Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I'm currently at home, um, but yes, I do work at the University of Melbourne. It feels like my second home and it really has felt for a long time. I did most of, well, all of my educational studies here and now I'm a lecturer in uh, educational leadership at MGSE. Fantastic. And quite possibly the most uh, important question for our conversation, what's your coffee order when I'm finally back down in Melbourne? (laughs) A skinny flat white. Lovely. Uh, (laughs) Is there a book uh, that has caused you to stop and reconsider things in your life? It could be within your sphere of expertise or it could be more broadly than that. Oh, Um, you might regret asking me this question. I love reading. I love reading from a very early age and um, I have been influenced, I think, by by books in, you know, not necessarily in education, but in, you know, throughout my my career. Also, the fact that I speak a number of languages, it means I have what I, I think is a real privilege to be able to read in in other languages. Um, I think I was ten when I read a wonderful book by a, a Brazilian. Uh, writer Vasconcelos, uh, a book called My Orange Lime Tree. I'm, I'm making my own my own translation, but it was about this child who found uh, a friend in a tree and a place for reflection. Oh. And I think very early um, in my life, I realized that reflection was so important, regardless of what it is that you ended up doing as an adult. And I think that is something that yeah. I've, I've tried to keep and and in education there are so many and there are new things coming out um you know uh ron rickhart has been a, a big yeah. um someone i champion a lot and i read i guess that takes me back to when i was a teacher in a school and and critical thinking and just pushing those boundaries for students is something that i'm very interested in um i yeah. love uh oh gosh all the work from the big uh, in my area of the leadership yeah. people you know yeah. uh, andy hargraves leafwood uh, and many others have been very influential and amazing. continue to be so mm. amazing i um uh, one of my favorite interviews was uh, that i did was with professor andy hargraves and he it ended up being this wonderful and beautiful existential conversation about his grandchildren and how they changed his life and it was it was a really uh, refreshing and really wonderful uh, conversation and I know with um, Professor Hargraves I feel like his his books are so approachable uh, and so accessible just like he is I can hear him 
through his work and it's yeah, really really wonderful to hear but also i think what i what and i fully agree with you and one of the things that i like about his writing is that um i got really into into what he was writing about during my phd and i was thinking you know you can and i often say this to my students you can convey very complex ideas in very simple mm -hmm. sentences you don't have to embellish everything you, you know the jargon just yeah. go straight to the point so it's also a very good way of learning how to write yes. and still have that deep um sharing of ideas behind yeah. that i remember learning that lesson as a kindergarten teacher i had to take these really complex ideas around phonics and phonemic mm -hmm. awareness and all these really challenging concepts and i had to um kind of uh, whittle them down to the essentials so that a five-year-old could understand them. And and I think it's it's very easy to complicate things. I think it's very difficult to keep things simple. And uh, one of the many things I found so refreshing about his work was just how approachable it was and how practical it was for people in the classroom. And uh, yeah, I, I love that his uh, work has had such an impact uh, in your life as well. I think that's really wonderful. Absolutely. Um, the final sort of getting to know you question, um, if you could have mm -hmm. a dinner party with anybody, uh, who would be there? I mean, your family are of course <laughs> invited and these people can be uh, are currently with us or past. Well, I have to include my parents simply because they don't live here and they live on the other side of the world. So any opportunity to have dinner yeah. with my mum and dad is something that I'll take. So I'm, I was born in Chile. I've been living here for 30 years, but all my family's back home. So uh, that... Um, I think um, Paulo Freire, mm -hmm. probably. Right. So big, big name in education, equity, um, in the way that we understand the purpose of education, of course, he's no longer around. So that would be someone that I would be very mm -hmm. interested to have dinner with. I've never met Andy Hargraves. Um, really? So maybe Andy, why not? Uh, you know, I, I'm familiar with his work and I, I think we, we follow each other on Twitter or, we, you know, I, I certainly know about him through there. But um, um, sounds like a wonderful yeah, dinner conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of people. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, just to give people a bit of a context to your work and we will um, I'll put links to, uh, to obviously your profile at the University of Melbourne and some of your recent publications in the show notes. But. Give us a bit of a, a a snapshot about what your upbringing was like and how did we get or how did you get to where you are today uh, in terms of education? Are there any, I've heard it said that you, you can't join the dots looking forward, but quite often you can when you turn around and look backwards. Has that been the case with you? Have there been some patterns or, yeah, you know, what's that process? I think so. Yeah, I think so. And that goes back to that sense of reflection that's such a big mm -hmm. part of my life not just professionally but personally so in a in a snapshot i'll try to remember that um i am um, uh, uh i grew up in a diplomatic family um and so from the age of six or seven i've spent my whole life until my early 20s traveling the world and experiencing different types of um education learning languages uh, ad being adaptable is something that is um, every pan de cada dia as we say in spanish it's bread of every day you know it's yeah. it's it's what i've had to do every day and i think that's made me very resilient it's um made me uh um welcome i guess the diversity of cultures and people that i have worked with Fantastic. i'm probably difficult to live with in the sense that i always want to be traveling like i can't sit still and i enjoy that i look for that um but also it gave me a sense of what education mm. needs to be regardless of where you are so there's a commonality yeah. there's something about the why and what it should look like that made me realize that even though I've traveled in so many places, went to 10, 12 different schools and all that, I was after the same thing. I think yeah. my parents were after the same thing. And maybe that's something that I, that I want to see um, in all schools and in all education systems yeah. that I come across. And what do you think are some of those um, commonalities? I know that's a whole podcast series in itself about what are the, but what do you think are some of those essential things that you learned must be at the core of of all education systems 
Well, I've probably learned them by the fact that they weren't there at the time, right. more from absence than presence. Uh, student voice. Yeah. Ask students in yeah. all decisions. Yeah. Obviously, that's contextual. You're not going to ask a prep student something that's a bit more complex, but uh, sometimes we just don't ask students um, yeah. about curriculum, about their well-being, uh, not necessarily that in terms of policy, for example, school policies. Um, do we include them? Do we yeah. really understand what their strengths are? And of course, we have these big walls that I call of you know standardized testing and and curriculum that has to be very you know narrow and and it has to be this. And sometimes, um, and I guess that's something I've learned also from the writings of um, uh, Ken Robinson. You know, sometimes schools can be really detrimental to to authentic education. Yeah, and. I've heard one of my previous podcast guests, forgive me, I, I can't remember who it is at the moment, but said that education is one of the only um, industries, if you like, in which we don't consult with the clients, which are indeed the students. And we don't actually take the time to ask them, what do they need and what do they require from an education mm. system? And mm. um, I, I think there are some really important, um, uh, really important questions to ask, Bernie. And do you feel like it's changing at the moment? Um, I mean, education seems to be in a, to me, from my point of view from Sydney, is it seems to be in a in a point of immense change. And my hope is that we will continue to do so. But are you hopeful in the directions that we seem to be moving? Oh, yeah, I'm, I am hopeful. And, and we're lucky in that education is an improvement That's area. Right. Um, or, or we, you know, we should all think that. And maybe all industries should be. But in, it, I think more explicitly, we like to think that we're here to improve things, mm -hmm. whether you're at the leadership end of education, in the classroom. I think we are moving in the right direction. I think we've had some really big stumbles like COVID that have made us realise that we can't really improve what we, the impact that we have on student learning and student wellbeing unless we actually ask them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing is that we've become a little bit more democratic. I remember hearing from my parents when they were at school or even but my very early years in school where you had the hierarchical nature of having the teacher and then student here meant that there was very little communication. And I think it's now we talk about more respect than anything mm -hmm. uh, rather than that hierarchical thing. And there's a need yeah to include students and, and what they think. I think we undermine a lot of the time what what they can offer us. Yeah, interesting. And so why, Bernie, then, have you focused so much of your career and so much of your research on um, school leadership and um, and the impact of school leadership? Is that uh, Why does that make such a difference? Well, it was kind of circumstantial. I was working um, in a school, uh, in an independent school here in Melbourne, a girls only school. I was head of Spanish. I had had lots of other middle leadership roles. I do a lot of work for the International Baccalaureate. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a, a while where I was leading that, um, acting head of languages, um, in well-being, head of house. And so I had all these leadership roles. And at the time in that school, I had an outstanding role model as a principal. Yeah. And so I was very lucky in that despite the size of the school that was very big, it always amazed me how even though I didn't see the principal every day, I may have not heard her voice every right. day, her presence was always there. And I thought it's impacting me. It's helping me to be motivated. I feel engaged. Yeah. She creates this sense of community, this sense of belonging. And I decided to go back to university, which I've always enjoyed doing. Studying has been always fascinating for me. And whilst working full time, I decided to go back to Melbourne Uni and do a master's in educational leadership, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And it provided me with more questions than answers. Interesting. And at that time, Halfway through that, my principal left and there was a change of principal. Right. And that transition, in my view, was not done adequately. And the impact, that negative impact in my eyes, of course, that yeah. negative impact was far higher, more, more uh, impactful than the positive impact I had received. Yeah. So it just made me think that leadership 
positive or not, is, is, is very important at every level. And so I got to the end of my master's and I had too many questions. So I continued and did my doctorate degree there as well. Fantastic. And my topic, which was teachers' perceptions of new leadership, was really as a result of what I had experienced and what my colleagues had experienced. So we had gone through that transition. It had been uh, messy, as I said, in my eyes. This is just my perception. And then when I started reading the literature on principal succession, on um, new leaders coming into schools, I realized that there was a common thread or a common unit of analysis, which was every study was, or most of the studies were coming from the new leadership perspective. So in other words, what the new leader did, how they behaved, what their leadership looked like, what their change initiatives were. And yet there seemed to be no study that I could really grasp that said, well, but how is all of this impacting on teachers? Mm. So I spoke, I spoke to those that um, eventually were my, my PhDs, my, you know, my doctoral supervisors, um, David Gurr and Laurie Drysdale from Melbourne Uni. And I said, look, this is what I want to do. It's not just looking at principal succession, but methodologically, I want to turn that coin around. I want the focus to be a little bit less on these new individuals coming in and more on well, what is what does this mean for teachers? Fantastic. And there's, there's so much uh, in that, Bernie. I just wanted to take you back to... Um, to your experience with this wonderful uh, school leader that you had, uh, the one that you said you felt their presence. Um, can you talk about an interaction you had uh, with that person and why that was so uh, important to you? What were some yeah. of the things that she was doing or addressing or what was Absolutely. that experience like? Yeah, I think there are many, but there's one in particular, and it comes back to this idea that I didn't interact with her on a daily basis. But at one point I ran into her and um, we were, well, we didn't run into each other. We were in some sort of function. I think it was at the end of a year 12 valedictory dinner or something like that. And she came up to me and she said, how are you going? How are things? You know, just started very casually. And then she said, I heard about what you did with the year eights in that class wow. and how you, you know, and, 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 and how you um, used uh, this activity. And I was thinking, where was she in the classroom? She, as far as I knew, she wasn't there. So Interesting. I, because we got along, I said to her, how do you know about that? And she said, I make it, I make it my, my responsibility. I want to know what's happening in the classroom. She said, I can't be everywhere. Interesting. Said, but I, I, I want to know. And so I was fascinated to hear about this. And I thought that's interesting. So you're kind of not, you can't be visible all the time, but you have a presence all the time. Mm. And there was a genuine interest also all the time when she addressed us, the, the staff, the wow. teaching staff, that we, uh, you know, that what we did was important. Interesting. I, I have the privilege of working for a absolutely wonderful principal. Um, and she is one of those principals that, um, really changed the game for me and I've also um uh worked for some principles that have had an impact in the in a less positive sense and so yes. I was really interested when I came across your work about the 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 impact that that type of that those type of leaders has on not only the students but also the staff and and I always I say to my current principal when you walk into a school you can sense the culture and when I went for this job interview in this particular school I'm at now I just you you just I just had this sense of, of of what the place was like. It was so difficult to explain, and the longer that I've been there, the more that I've learned that that is actually that comes from the principle, that culture, that excitement for learning, that that um that genuine care and compassion for students and staff. I think um I think it's really important, and it's something which is it. I mean, how do you measure the impact of a great principle? Because I think it's it's difficult to kind of capture some of those things that are difficult to measure so would you mind maybe talking about some of your research yeah yeah Jeez, absolutely how do, you, how do you capture that valuable information yeah so first of all that thing about culture um you know it's 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 very challenging to create the right culture or to have the right culture especially if you're coming in as a new principal because principals or new leaders in general within education or not they really want to make they they're, they're change agents 
they want to change things and many want to just have that stamp on and they want to do that very quickly. And I think that's very hard. You can't really just come in and change things a lot. In fact, I was just talking to someone on the weekend about a principal who just came in, you know, wanted to come in and change everything. And she said, it's disastrous. And I said, well, you can't do that. I think one of the things that the ways in which we measure principal success, you can have informal ways and formal ways. So informally, it's it's that sense that you were talking about. You hear, you can talk to teachers about, you know, why they're doing what they're doing, what motivates them to do that, how they feel supported by the principal. Also, you can measure it by the consistency and by the language that's being used. One of the principals in my study um, said that before he uh, made changes to the school, he wanted to change the language of the school. Mm. And so he he deliberately used different vocabulary, um, you know, the, the language of improvement, the language about belonging, the language about collaboration. And it was explicit. And mm. I said to him, when are you going to stop being the new principal? And he said, when people are using my language. And they did. And they did. And that's how we made change. So that's one way of doing it. We have other formal ways, of course. There are, you know, 360 um, ways of assessing where principals can, you know, get a different sense of how they're doing and, and they receive feedback about that and there are improvement plans that they can put together. I think we also have to remember that a principal is also a middle leader. We often forget this. So yes. they manage we, we can think of them as managing down in a way, but principals also have to manage up. So they have a board, there's a school board in the Catholic system. It may, you know, include part of the clergy or part of their congregation, but there's also that sense that they that they are in the middle up to a certain way. So getting a sense of what impact they're having in terms of trust, for example. Are they being trusted in the role that they're in is very important as well. Interesting. So um, I, I know this is quite a broad question and obviously uh, I'm in New South Wales and you're speaking from a, a Victorian context, but what are some of the things that principal training uh, training programs do well? Um, and also what are some things that you would like to see, uh, see changed? I know we have in, uh, we have the eight school, uh, the, the, um, uh, principal standard, which is very, some very clearly uh, defined um, uh, as skills that, that we expect principals to have. But is there any sort of essential qualities of principal training programs or any that you'd like to see added? Yeah, that's an interesting question, one that we, we explore a lot in our, in our subjects, in our Masters of Ed Leadership. And, and we, I, what I do is look at an international comparative way of, of how do we prepare leaders? I mean, then you have extremes in the United States, for example, a country where you have mandatory programs. I mean, you cannot possibly become a principal unless you go through this very rigorous pipeline that they call, um, which can have some benefits. But on the other hand, making it mandatory doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to be successful. If we look at Australia, for example, we have something more of a like a, a do-it-yourself ad hoc kind of program, more of an apprentice. Because honestly, in Australia, uh, until very recently with, with the VAPA, which is a new initiative for public schools um, in, in Victoria, all you needed was a teaching, edu a teaching degree and to be registered, in this case in Victoria, by the VIT. And right. so you, you do your own little little bit of you know maybe doing a master's or you know obviously having experience in middle leadership and such and so you can find different different candidates that want to that aspire to be principals that come with different types of, of leadership mm -hmm. skills i think first of all we have to acknowledge that if, if there's anything that we've really come uh, improved in in terms of school leadership is that we know you can become that you can be trained to become a leader i mean you know 80, 100 years ago, we thought leaders were born, they were male, they were white, mm -hmm. and, you know, you couldn't become one. You either were born like that or you weren't. So Shocking, we have, isn't it? We have come a long way in that sense. Yeah. What I, going back to your question, I think what I would like to see different is a continuous support for principles. So we might do inductions very well. We might do... Uh, leadership preparations like the new Victorian Aspiring Principles program that's now running. But once you're in the job, 
once you're dealing with the complexity of what it is to be a principal, because despite knowing that leadership can come from different and should come from different parts of the school, and you as a principal may be surrounded by a fantastic leadership team, at the end of the day, the strongest, the, the, the most important source of leadership is the principal. We can't deny that. So once you're really experiencing that, what is the support that's coming in? Where are principals venting out or using uh, a soundboard, perhaps externally? So I'm thinking about coaching. I'm thinking about ongoing mentoring. Um, yeah. Sometimes principals have been, that have been in the school for a very long time are very successful, but they need to be constantly re-imaging their ideas and their uh, profile, their identity. It's an identity, ongoing yeah. identity process as well. So that's what I'd like to see probably um, improved. And I think it's something that we're dealing with now when we see, right. when we hear about principles, um, you know, retention, when we hear about principal uh, morale, well-being. It's, it's a tough job. The more I studied principles, I personally, the less I wanted to become one because I thought, my God, you know, it's it's just so powerful. There's so much that you have to do. I I really salute principals in in everywhere. They're just amazing people. I I did an interview with Dr. Adam Fraser a little while ago, and he was talking about um he he's not uh, doesn't have a background in education, but he said by far the most complicated job that they have ever studied uh, is that of the role of the principal. Um, and I think the the complexities are just astounding. Um, and so, Bernie, why do um, perceptions of new teachers actually matter? So in schools, if you think about you've got your leadership, you've got your students, we're thinking stakeholders or, or, or you know, different mini context within our context of schools. If, if we are all about, if our why, our rationale is really about that positive, long-lasting impact on student learning and well-being then who are the closest people to those students where is the direct impact that's going to have where, where is that if we had a diagram it's teachers leadership can have an impact on student learning but it's indirect mm. and it's unless it's via teachers then it's not going to happen. So as, as the principal that I spoke about in my study just a little while ago, as he said to me, I can't just hope to have the best students in my school. Before that, I have to make sure I have the best teachers in my school. Yeah. If I don't have the most, you know, the best teachers in my school, the, the student learning is not going to happen. Now, best teachers, and I take those words, I think of... Um, not just better at, in their knowledge, um, in their capacity to collaborate. I think individuals, human beings who are happy to work where they are, who are aligned with that leadership's mm. communication as well, that, you know, making mm -hmm. that, that students are at the centre of everything we do. That's why it's important, because if I have teachers who perceive school leadership, who perceive the principal as misaligned, as not um, congruent with the school values or who perceive leadership or a principal who does not really care or show any concern for the professional development or the professional advancement and well-being of themselves as teachers, I don't think I can be the best teacher that I can be. Yeah, yeah. I think that's incredibly important and I think I, I talk about this with my team a lot. Perception is everything. Um, uh, you may be doing the best job you can, but if you lose that trust and if you lose that um, that belief, uh, we talk about specifically in terms of parents, like if the, the perceptions of our parents really matter. Um, if they uh, lose trust or lose faith in you, then that's regardless of what you are doing, that's something mm. which needs to mm. be prepared. And yeah. Yeah, and self awareness. I mean, it's part of that as well because one of the one of the things I did in my study, despite the unit of analysis being number one, the teachers in my case studies. Of course, I also interviewed the principals, and so I looked at that. You know, teachers perceive you like this, and you perceive yourself like this. Most of the time, mm -hmm. when the principals um, 
were perceived successfully by teachers, the principal also felt that he was like that. So there was very yeah. little gap between that. But it didn't always happen. So it's important for principals to say, well, I think I'm doing a great job. Yeah. Uh, but is that how I'm being perceived? Yeah. And I think that brings us back to what leadership is to mm. begin with. I mean, leadership is an yeah. attribute. I can't say I'm a leader uh, myself. You know, yeah. it's like if someone says to me, well, are you a good mum? You know, I have two boys. And I'm like, well, ask them. I think you better ask the boys. <laughs> You know, I might have a sense of it, but what's really going to be important here is yeah. whether they feel they have a good mother. Yeah, and I um, one of the things that I've started doing with my leadership, and this is something which I've stolen from my wonderful boss, is on my door, <clears throat> I have two QR codes, um, one that's, that students can scan and it takes them to a survey. Um, and in that survey, it may say things like, Mr. Green listens to me, Mr. Green's kind. I think Mr. Green cares and they basically rate me on a scale from one to 10. Um, and I found that really valuable because I can, I may think I'm an approachable teacher and kind yeah. and considerate, but if my clients or my students don't think so, then I miss the point. And I also do that with my leadership and um, it's been really interesting and quite confronting because I may think I've dealt with, and I invite all staff members all students, regardless of what stages they're in, or whether they work directly with me to give me feedback, because yeah. I want to know. And um, it was funny, I had an argument with my wife, uh, and she found the survey uh, on her computer that I was working on, and she didn't give me some very good feedback. Uh, <laughs> said that I don't actively listen to her. And, and I think she was being, uh, I think she was joking, but we, we have to try and find ways to to capture that really valuable information and yeah. so um yeah I, I loved uh, i wanted to speak specifically about the the work uh titled and ensuring success during a change of principle and mm. it, i it talk about a kaleidoscopic approach towards teacher perceptions of new principles and i'll add this to the show notes but i, I we've talked a lot about those things uh some of those things uh previously and talked about building relationships and visibility and uh so many different types of things that um I love that you've actually asked teachers what they need. Um, and I love that it's from a, the perspective of those in which the leadership really impacts. And why is it important to have that kaleidoscopic approach? And um, what are some lessons you think we can learn from that? Um, a fascinating article, by the way, really Thank easy. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed approach. it. And, and also Thank very you. well designed. I don't know why I think that, <laughs> it looks Thank beautiful. You. But yes, please. Uh, I use metaphors a lot. I think yeah. um, it, they help me to understand concepts. And yes. I think it comes from my language background experiences. Sometimes I don't always have had the the language um, vocabulary, perhaps growing up as I had to learn new languages quite quickly. And so sometimes just reaching out for some metaphors, it helped. And I that sense of looking at the same concept um, with a different lens, like in this case, leadership, and just looking at it and say, I'm going to turn it and look at and have a look at it from the from the principal perspective. Oh, this is what it looks like. And right. then I'm going to turn it around and say, well, how do teachers, what, what's the teacher lens? What's the student lens? And I thought, kaleidoscopes, and my children laugh at me because I still have <laughs> some accent issues. And they keep saying, mom, you've got to, you can't even say kaleidoscope properly. <laughs> So they helped me with yeah. my English. Um, so I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it properly. But what's important here is that we don't, we can't get a sense of leadership if we only use one lens. I love it. I love it. We, we can't. It's just impossible. And, you know, because the perception comes in because leadership is, is active, it's mobile, it, it changes shape all the time. It's so sensitive to context and we know context changes all mm. the time. So unless we have that, we're not going to get a good sense of it. And I think leadership in particular, when it's new, new leadership, anything that's new is shiny and catches our eye, yes. whether it's a new pair of shoes, you know, I, I just bought myself a new pair of, of boots and I love them. And so Whenever I can, I kind of look at them again if they're in my wardrobe, you know. So yeah. whether yeah. it's that or whether it's leadership, it's new, it, it's it's attractive just by the fact that it's new to begin with. And so it's an opportunity 
to start well. It's an opportunity to say, well, you know, it's new, but let's try to make few mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes, but let's try, you know, try to get it right. Getting teachers on board with new leadership is very important mm. because principals, if they're there for the right reasons, which most of them are, you know, 99.9% of them are, they want to improve. Mm. They want to, um, you know, a good one will be cons consistently, or, you know, all the time assessing the effectiveness of the school, what's working, you know, what needs to change and how are we going to do that? So that sense of mm. effectiveness and improvement is very important. So, as I said, teachers are a mini context that is very powerful in school improvement goals because if the ultimate improvement goal is that improvement in student learning and well-being yeah. you can't do it without them also it's about trust you mentioned feedback before of, and I loved that when you said that you create an environment a culture I guess where your staff your colleagues and your students feel that they can provide you that feedback mm. but that happens because there's trust there yeah. And trust is does not come automatically with new leadership because you have you have the role, you have the person who is in that role, what we call the principal, but then there's the individual. So uh, there's a wonderful article of, from a set of um, Canadian scholars who wrote about how do new principals develop trust? You know, how is this done? And I quote them a lot in, a lot in my in my thesis. And they developed this way of saying, well, sometimes principals first, their first stage is to trust the role. So, oh, mm. we have a new principal. You know, we have to trust the mm. principal. But then what about the individual? And how do we move from, you know, trusting just the role of the principal to the individual who's going to mm. support us, who's going to make the right decision? So, Unless you've built that trust, you're not going to get some genuine feedback. So it's yeah. it's very important to develop that. Yeah, it's so important, and it's um, and I wanted to quote um, Professor Hargraves here, and then um, link it to some of your work. Um, it says a change in leadership is possibly the most significant event in a school's mm. life, and more often than not, it is the least successful. And then um, in your work, you talk about the importance of having a, a, a principal succession plan. Um, yes. And I have, I mean, it seems such, like such an obvious idea, um, uh, but I, I, I don't know why schools don't have that. But would you mind maybe talking a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. It is to, to actually set, um, actually, yeah, have a, have a succession plan and why uh, why that can really make a difference. Yeah, definitely. I think if we look to the very beginning of, of times, you know, if we think about um, uh, feudal systems or in, in medieval or, or Renaissance societies, how did succession happen in trade mm -hmm. and in business? Well, it was pretty obvious. Your ch you had children and your children just took over. Yeah. So that was your succession plan. And it, it was a succession plan. And it obviously worked up to a certain extent. Now, if we look at the business world, the business world has done succession far better than, say, in education. They actually do have frameworks in place. They think about it. They talk about succession, okay? yeah. developing your own, grooming, you know, your yeah. own so they can become members like that. In schools, we're not, we haven't been that good at it. I mean, some of them do it very well, but others don't. And I, I wonder if it's related also to politics. We mm. don't always do that very well. And I think sometimes what happens, one of the obstacles is that we get blocked in. We just focus on what, what principles or what leadership is doing at the moment without thinking that the minute you step into new leadership, that's step one of succession planning. We've got to start thinking, what's going, what's, the, what am I going to do in the next years to how am I going to lead in what state am I going to lead this school for the next person to take over? Mm. So it's about having that look into the future that is way beyond what I'm doing. It's for the better good. It's, it, it's for something beyond that. Not the students that I have now, the ones that I know, the year 12s that I have now and then will go into university or the workforce or, you know, trade, whatever it is. It's 
what do I want education to look like? You don't stop thinking about that just because you're going to stop being the principal. And there are different ways in which principals, the ones that that do worry about principal succession, do that. You know, they might have um, frameworks or, or uh, ways in their own schools to attract new talent. They create opportunities for people to engage in leadership. They create distributed leadership in a way that incorporates um, more decision making. Um, others yeah. will tap on the shoulder. Uh, you know, there are benefits of that and, and, and not so much that can be perceived as, you know, favoritism. So it's, you have to be very careful about that. But if, if it's based on equity and excellence, then it should be there. We should talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe that it's something we need, we need to talk about. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I think school boards. I think governance is something that they yeah. don't do that very well as well. They, they, you know, it needs to be thought yeah. about and, 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 you know. There's, there's so much in that, Bernie. I feel like there is a, uh, as I said, a whole podcast series in transition in schools, which, which we could, uh, we could talk about. Yeah. Uh, I did want to take you back um, to your experience um, with a transitioning from uh, your wonderful school principal to one that an environment that you found more challenging, because I feel like that, forms a really nice um, structure around our discussion today. And what are some of the things in that transition that were particularly challenging? Um, and um, yeah, what was that experience like for you um, as you yeah, moved from a Yeah, definitely. And I think they also, they're also reflected in that six, in the success, uh, ensuring success article, yeah. um, lack of communication. So yeah. the, the, the interim leadership uh, team that we had, and, and and the school board, which was very much involved as part of, of, of this um, change in leadership, um, yeah. didn't really give us what we needed. I don't, I think they did not trust us in some way or felt that they, um, that we didn't need to know. We just needed to be in our classroom, you know, um, doing, doing what we did. So that made me think, wow, very different very different perception of how leadership works with teachers from my previous principal than this. So that was, that, that gave us a lot of low morale that made us yeah. feel um, that we didn't really count. Uh, I'm not saying we all should have been part of the decision-making. Uh, we, we, we can't all be part of the decision-making, but wouldn't you want to know how we can work with you mm. to make the transition better. Wouldn't you want to have all of us on board? Wouldn't you want to hear yeah. perhaps through a survey because it was a big school, what our thoughts were on perhaps what the type of principal we needed. Only one school um, in my case studies, in my thesis, teachers were actually asked to say, what do you think we need? Um, you know, what's, what's the type of leadership or principle you think uh, we need at this moment in time in our school? It doesn't mean all of those ideas were going to be considered uh, when the position was going to be advertised. But as, as a leader, I, I, the more I know, the more informed I am, mm. the better I'm going, the, the, the better the decision I guess I'm going to make or, or, or at least I'll know what is happening because, yeah. you, you know, you need to be informed. So why do you think that's not the case? I mean, uh, is it just easier? To, is it self-awareness? Is it just easier to assume that people making those decisions know best? Um, is it just a bit too messy asking everybody their opinion? Why do you think? Lots of things. Uh, I, you know, in this particular case, I don't have enough, you know, evidences that I think I can only tell you what I yeah, think it is. Of course. And this brings me back to my, to, to, to what I, the way I feel about two concepts, leadership and management. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, for me, they're two different things. Yes, absolutely. And for me, they're two necessary things. So. I think we need leadership in schools, in education. I think we need management as well. But I think they respond to different things. I think their tasks, their um, their goals or, or, or their responsibilities are different. And sometimes, Matthew, when you have, uh, and I see this in politics a lot as well, when you have managers making decisions that really should be decisions on leadership, 
that can be a problem. And mm. sometimes you have leadership making decisions about management and it doesn't work either. Big, you know, so you need yeah. both. I think both are part of a bigger picture. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but sometimes if, if you're making manage, if management or managers are making decisions that are about long term, that are about um, setting direction, about where we want to be, that sense that I gave earlier about beyond my time here, I think that's a bit more on leadership. And I think sometimes the manager side is like, well, just do it quickly. Well, you know, it'll be just a quick decision. We don't need everyone involved. And I think that can be a mistake. Yeah. How how then do you define leadership? Um, has your and has your perception of leadership uh, changed as you've looked into the research? Yeah. How, how do you define? Absolutely, that? absolutely. And I, and and I'm glad about that. I mean, one of the things, um, you know, you think, oh, why is it changing again? And then I think, well, no, it has to change again. Uh, because things are changing. I think leadership for me is about influence. And mm. this is something that I've been challenged about lately in my own reading because influence and, and then, you know, it, it, how benevolent is that influence? You know, if I say I'm a principal and I want to have a positive influence, this is what our goals are. This is what our values are, this is what we believe in, then we all have to work together to do that. I mean, most principles will think like that. You know, we want everyone on board. Um, we want everyone aligned. But is that influence saying, mm. you have to think like me? Do you have mm. to think of what I'm doing? Luckily, if we put the students and student learning and student well-being at the centre of all of our decisions, then it's not about me anymore. Mm. But it's about them. And ultimately, it has to be that. But I think it's about influence. I think it's about improvement. I think leadership in any setting, let alone in education, in any setting is about the improvement of others. We have to remember that schools are, you know, we want schools to improve, but, but who are inside those schools? We have individuals. So being committed to developing individuals to be the best they can mm. be can only enhance a school being the best it can be at a collective level. Absolutely. So keeping that balance between the individual and the school is important. I saw that maybe that's what I saw with this principal when she approached me and said, you know, in, in other words, in such a big school, I know what you're doing in your classroom. And I know the kids, are, the girls like it, or, or they've actually learned Spanish, you know, um, it's having that impact on their learning and they want to come to your class or things like that. So I think, I think it's about that. Yeah. And I think about like what that would do uh, and, and what that would do to somebody to, to feel as if their principal was noticing them, to feel as if they were making a difference to, I think things like specific praise is so important because if she had turned around and said, I think you're doing a good job and walked away, it wouldn't have been as meaningful as that specific yeah. example. And I think that's wonderful. One of the things that um, anecdotally that I've, when I've had conversations with teachers, most of our of teachers are, I mean, our students are, are teachers in a Master of Educational Leadership. They're teachers either in middle leadership roles or not, or are aspiring to be in, in leadership roles. So they come and do the masters with us. And during COVID, when we were doing all our teaching, of course, online, um, we had this wonderful opportunity to chat with them about, you know, how's it going? How's the principal, you know, just to get, get a mm -hmm. sense of how they were traveling. And so many teachers said, wow, principals have really stepped up. We never saw the principal before. Now on COVID, it's like he or she are always there. They're communicating mm -hmm. with us yeah. and you think fabulous. And now I'm, I'm about to give a paper in Belfast. Call, I've called it um, uh, uh, leading in and out of a pandemic. Wow. So principals, how did they lead into it? But now, even though we're still kind of in COVID, but in a more manageable way, how are they leading out of it? So yeah. are those principles that those teachers were talking to me about, have they gone back to their old ways or yeah. have they actually reflected and said, wow, this, this really worked. This had an impact on my relationship yeah. with stuff. I'll keep that practice. Yeah. I, I love that. And um, I remember doing a um, some professional learning with um, Dr. Simon Brakespear and he's talking oh, about yes, yes, what yeah. are some of the things that we 
um, are happy to keep um, as mm. a result of the pandemic? What are some things that we are happy to change? And Absolutely. that idea that we cannot just spring back into old habits just because it's what we've always done. And mm. I'm so proud to um, to be part of an organization that really um, that really changed and to see so That's many brilliant. educators step up. I never in a million years thought my role would go online and it did overnight. Uh, yeah. And yeah, really lovely. Um, and I think it, it has taught, taught us so many things, um, uh, but also just the, the real significance of the work that, that mm. us teachers do. Um, Absolutely. Are you, are you able to give us a couple of findings from your um, talk that you're about to present in uh, in Belgium, or do we have to wait? Uh, in, in Belfast. In Belfast, Belfast, sorry. Belfast. No, not at all, not at all. So I've been looking at um, new principles uh, that were appointed during COVID. Wow. In the state of Victoria. It's been a little bit challenging because um, we haven't had full access until very recently to um, have a chat to them because uh, researching during COVID, of course, was limited. And, and, and we understand that, you know, the last thing you want with COVID is to have someone knock on your door and say, hey, can I come and do some research? Although mine is very, very mild in the sense that I only talk to principals for this study. I don't have to go in or, you know. Uh, bother students or interrupt classrooms but nonetheless they're very busy people um some of the things that i've noticed is that um sometimes the reasons why some principals have not been able to keep those wonderful things that they initiated is a backlash from teachers teachers are tired they're exhausted and sometimes for teachers going back to what was already the norm is kind of easier yeah so how do we support how do we support that and where's the root of the problem? Is it, do we just convince them that it's better, but why are they so tired? Maybe that's where we start mm -hmm. and say, you know, let's build on this. How can we make it better? So start, there's, there's some of the things that we're finding. Principles also that uh, worked in schools that already had quite a distributed leadership model, whether it was initiated by them or it was already established by the time they took on the role, certainly seemed to operate um, in a much more um, uh, easier way, leading in and leading out. Mm. So established responsibilities, um, high level of trust uh, that was already between the leadership team and amongst teachers so that when a new principal comes, is able to um, tap on that. Interesting. And, and, and to be able to, to use that as a strength for developing their own talent. Um, so there's some of the things that we're finding. And I think it's interesting because we may come, you know, we, we, well, people are saying we will have another pandemic. But, but what about little minor pandemics? What about, you know, the uncertainty has always been there. Sometimes we think, oh, the uncertainty in schools with the pandemic. Well, it was probably more uncertainty, but uncertainty has always been there. In decision making you know how do we know we make decisions with with whatever information we have so this sure. is a good opportunity to remember how do we do that how do we inform ourselves as principals as leaders to make sure that whatever decision we make is going to have the the, the best um you know um amazing. outcome amazing, amazing for our students and teachers yeah i think that's um it sounds like a really wonderful piece of research and um I, i'd love to read a little deeper into that it sounds yeah like. i'll publish it after I, I give it in the conference so yeah i'll yes. let you know look um bernie i want to be respectful of your time i'm, a, I'm very grateful that you would uh, talk to me today so um just one final question um imagine uh we were sitting down uh, having a coffee in wonderful melbourne and i was just about to step into my leadership uh, into a leadership position for the first time or oh, sorry a, a principalship position for the first time um what advice would you give me be visible be visible every day yeah make time make it intentional yeah be intentional about your visibility don't just walk around think about it I'm going to go and walk around and talk to students. I'm going to go into the staff room and have a chat to teachers. That's the first thing. Fantastic. The other thing would be don't make changes quickly. That's one of the first things. Great. Get a sense of the effectiveness of the school. What's working? Every school will have a strength. 
at yeah. least something that's going well. Yeah. Don't ditch that. Build on it. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Bernie, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm really grateful that you would talk to me. And my hope is that there would be teachers all around the world that would get something from our discussion today. So I am incredibly grateful um, and I can't wait to continue to follow your work. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. It's always lovely to talk about education. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Art of Teaching podcast today. I hope that you, like me, got some valuable insights out of our discussions. For show notes, please visit theartofteachingpodcast.com. And I've also created a private Facebook group where we continue the discussion there. The link will be in the show notes. Thanks again for listening and can't wait to see you for next week's episode.